And welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our special guest author is Dr. Thomas W. McGovern. His book is What Christ Suffered, A Doctor's Journey Through the Passion, published by OSV, available through our EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com. For all things Catholic, welcome, Doctor, to EWTN's Bookmark. Nice to have you here. Great to be here, Doug. First time you're on our show. Yes, sir. Uh, you've been featured on some other programs on the network, but you're also known from, from radio, right? Uh, yes, we get to do this little gig called Doctor Doctor. Uh, two of my friends and I take turns co-hosting it every uh, Saturday morning, 11 a.m. Eastern Time on right. the radio network. Right, exactly. So let's talk about what Christ suffered, a doctor's journey through the Passion. What do you bring that's new on this topic? I think there's two essential things that are not found in other books. Uh, one is I... I, I I disassemble fallacies that have been out there about the crucifixion for years by going back in history, unlike any other medical author, relying on people that are outside the field of medicine. Back to 500 BC and all writings, archaeology, inscriptions, graffiti artwork related to crucifixion. So I'm able to see what, what was the contemporary practice of crucifixion like. The second thing I do, because I was asked by my bishop years ago for doctors and nurses to write a course on the meaning of human suffering and how we as physicians and nurses can address it in our patients. So this book is both uh, anatomy and physiology of crucifixion, but it's also the practical aspects of suffering. What does it mean and how can we suffer better? Now you talk about here uh, the idea that while deciding whether or how to pursue this particular project, uh, I read a 2006 article critical of the yes. many published efforts of physicians on how to explain crucifixions victims and how they died yes. and then you go on there's there's five different uh, mm -hmm. categories here one is there are at least 10 presented hypotheses as to the causes of Jesus's death on the cross yes do you think you know what the right one is or can I you nail it down to one is nail supposed to be a pun uh, I think unintentional yes I think there is uh, a most likely uh, and in fact, when I wrote a course on this for Catholic Distance University, I kind of ranked my level of certainty. So I can say what I think is by far the most likely. Other things are possible, mm -hmm. others are plausible, and others are almost completely unlikely. Okay. And you say no Roman era instructions for crucifixion have ever been found. There is actually an inscription that has been found in Putioli, which is near modern-day Naples, that was done during the reign of the Emperor Augustus uh, before Christ was born mm -hmm. about instructions for undertakers. And part of the instructions are how to create some of your own business through crucifixion. Really? Really. Okay. Uh, and very few prior authors quote crucifixion literature from antiquity, and you were referencing that just before. Oh, I do it heavily, and I rely on the work of John Granger Cook, who we recently hired on Dr. Doctor. He's mm -hmm. written the definitive book on the history of crucifixion in the Mediterranean. I thought this was interesting because a lot of times you, you get the impression that, that this is an important way of analyzing this. Crucifixion reenactment information is of limited relevance. Well, that's what the author said. Right. I think it's of some relevance. Mm -hmm. in, in other words, if a patient, if a, somebody who's in a 72 degree room, not nailed, but just strapped to a cross, uh, cannot do something, well, then I think a crucifixion victim couldn't do it. But just because they could do it doesn't mean that somebody nailed through the wrists and the feet could do it. Right. You say, as you read this book, I want you're learning about the passion of Christ to be more than just a mental m message or mes massage. mental massage, really, mental massage. more than satisfying curiosity, even more than learning how to meditate more deeply on the sorrowful mystery of the rosary. I want this book to help you love Jesus more. I want your reading of the book to lead you to a more effective exercise of your baptismal priesthood. Yes. In fact, inspired to do good to those who suffer. Yes. And, and you see that as well as a connection in a sense to being a doctor, as you alluded to earlier, in dealing with people who suffer. Well, sure. I want the book to appeal to the mind, the will, and the emotions. All three. Many of these have just appealed to the mind, a little bit to the emotions, but the will. How can I act differently? And I think all of us baptized Christians have a superpower. The essence of priesthood, our baptismal priesthood, is to offer sacrifice mm -hmm. on behalf of others. And we can offer our sacrifice on behalf of the redemption of others and affect eternity. Uh, that's better than any Marvel superhero superpower. Right. It's interesting you quoted, of all people, Phil Spector. <laughs> yes. And talking about to know him is to love him having to do with a, a song that he wrote based on the words written on his uh, 
father's tombstone. Right, to know Jesus more is to love him more. How can we help it when we learn what he did for us? Right, there, uh, Phil had a lot of suffering, obviously, <laughs> in his life from apparently what happened. Yes. Uh, now, you talk about the idea that for the last couple of decades, superheroes w wielding various superpowers have been what the major, yes. you know, entertainment focus mm -hmm. has been. But you say Christ has given each of us superpowers greater than any of these. That superpower can be summed up in three words many Catholics <laughs> grew up hearing daily, words yes. they often roll their eyes over, and that is... Offer it you know, up. Right. Actually, I like to say it's the three words that wives like to tell their husbands when they're complaining. There you go. <laughs> Mother Angelica uh, would say it many, many times. <laughs> I don't doubt that. And you, you talk about Christ left us an example of how to suffer. How so? Well, he offered it up for our salvation. So through his suffering, he achieved the greatest good. The greatest evil, the death of God, achieved the greatest good, the salvation of the entire human race. Well, Christ lives in us. We can do the same thing for our neighbor and affect eternity. Now, you, you talk about in the beginning about what is suffering, and I kind of move past that to stage two for the cosmic sacrifice. Uh, and you talk about analyzing things and, and the idea of is the year 33 the right year. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have some pretty interesting analysis how you nail it down. Want to explain Well, that. I relied on, you know, Jimmy Aiken, uh, who many listeners Catholic may know answers. about. Yes. Yeah. Uh, as well as, there's such a thing as an archaeoastronomist. Didn't know there was such a thing, but I've read papers by them nailing down different dates. And just by the data in the Gospels, mm -hmm. who was governor, you know, Pontius Pilate, who was emperor, what year of the governor, what year of the... It's clear that there were only two Passovers that could have, that would have started on a Friday mm -hmm. between, I think it was 26 and 35 when Pontius Pilate was doing his thing there, and these were 30 and 33. And yet the year of God, the, year, the word of God came to John in the desert, and it would have been the year 29 based on what year it was mm -hmm. of the emperor. And we know Jesus lived at least three Passovers. So from 29 to 30, you're not going to get three Passovers. So it had to be 33. 33 is what And in fact, John Paul II wrote his document on suffering in honor of the 1950th anniversary of the redemption. What year did he release it? 1983. So the church has recognized apparently 33 for quite a while. Right. And, and you actually nail it down here to Friday, April 3rd, the year mm -hmm. 33. Correct. Because uh, Passover is the first, would have been the first... Day, it has to do with when the first full moon is after the uh, spring equinox. Mm -hmm. So do you agree that the Last Supper was not a Passover meal? From what I understand, it was uh, the transformation of the Passover meal. It was celebrated like it. Uh, so no, I think it was on Thursday and the real Passover meal, the real slaughtering of the lambs mm -hmm. would have taken place at the time Jesus died. Right, because uh, Pope Benedict seemed to be of that. Uh, I trust him. He's same, good with the Gospels. Same <laughs> opinion. And, and you, also, you also talk about the Roman historian Tacitus who writes about Christus and the procurator Pontius Pilate and all of that coming together. So, yes. so there's, and people have said there's more historical evidence directly about that mm -hmm. than there is about a lot of people in history that we take for granted. Correct. Another thing you did, which I thought was very interesting in the book, was by looking at the map and the mm -hmm. layout, and in a sense showing the close proximity of the locations, and also the fact that in theory, since Pontius Pilate would not have been located in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. that he would have, probably would have stayed at Herod's palace when he was in right. Jerusalem. Not the fortress of Antonia, like so many people believe, like the Via Dolorosa right. begins. And if you were in Mass on uh, Palm Sunday this year, we read from Mark's Gospel. It's clear in Mark, and I pointed this out to a scripture scholar on one of my trips to the Holy Land, and he's like, I didn't realize that. And it says, where did they go to Pilate? To the palace, that is the praetorium. The only palace there was Herod's palace. Mm -hmm. Pilate was Herod's superior. Why would he stay in this little dingy barracks instead of going to the swanky palace? And you also make the point out that the, the, the Fortress Antonio maybe ha handled less than a cohort. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, wasn't this giant place with a legion there. Correct. Uh, it was just temporary during the right. three big feasts. Right, exactly. Now, you also talk about, in each of the chapters describing the physical suffering of Jesus, I'll share with one or more quotes from other medical authors about Jesus' suffering. Yes. My goal is to give examples of the beliefs and understandings that seem to be the most popular and accepted. Then you go on to say that I'd like to put you 
in a sense, with the detective hat yes. and read through the chapter to determine whether these beliefs are warranted or based on evidence. So, right. so, it, so you write it in a sense like a little Sherlock Holmes story in a way. Oh, exactly, because that's my favorite kind of book. Yeah, it's my okay. favorite kind of TV show to watch. I think people like looking for answers. And I must say, a lot of what's in the book I, I taught the opposite for like 20 years of giving talks. So this is the fruit of a lot of humiliation, finding out I was wrong, at least based on the evidence. The other thing you talk about, you, in chapter five, you talk about the scourging, yes. and you go through about all the different kinds of scourging, utensils. Mm -hmm. Why does it matter what's different, and how did you come up with the one that you thought that got used? Well, f first of all, it's uh, commonly believed that the scourge of Jesus had both little pieces of metal, lead, and sharp pieces of bone, but that's not possible because the Romans never did the pieces of bone, only the Greeks did. And then if we believe that the Shroud of Turin is the burial cloth of Christ, and I believe it takes more faith to believe it is not mm. than that it is, there are no sharp tearing type marks on there, they're just a little round like lead balls. Uh, also, scourging implements have been found in the catacombs, and they're made of chains of, of bronze with smaller chains coming off, and each of these chains usually have a pair of little lead balls, about three of an inch in diameter. Yes, heavy. Right. And, and those match then, as you talk about in the shroud, mm -hmm. the, 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 what the impact you see on our, yes. on our Lord's body based on the shroud as opposed to the tearing Correct. that you would get from the other version. But right? nevertheless, repeated pounding would finally weaken the skin that it would break and bleed. Because remember, the only marks you would see on the shroud is where blood left the skin. Mm -hmm. So any time that the scourge hit and there was no bleeding, you don't see those marks. So there were many more marks, many more scourges, uh, then there are marks on the shroud. And you even talk about the idea of mostly in the back, mostly lower, what his positioning might have been. Oh, that's a great question. I've been searching for that for years. Mm -hmm. uh, and the best I can come up with is in Acts, it talks about Paul being flogged and his arms are apparently up above him like that. But other than that, there's nothing in any of the literature I could find. In fact, when reading about crucifixion, scourging was a common preliminary, but it was most commonly done when the victim was carrying the cross while they were in motion. We know that wasn't the case with Christ. Right. You also make the reference, because your own military background, that in analyzing <laughs> many of the things that the, that the quote unquote Roman soldiers supposedly did or didn't do, that they would tend to be like most military men and take the easiest course of action and do it the least amount of work to get the job done. Correct. How does that relate to the actual uh, the, the crown of thorns. Okay, uh, the, if you're a soldier and you want to make fun of a prisoner, you don't want to do it at your expense, you want to do it at his expense. So if you're trying to form this nice little ring of thorns that doesn't grow that way, you're gonna cut yourself a lot. So it's more likely that you're gonna just take it and try to mash it on top of the head. And even the words in the Gospels uh, suggest that it was more a cap of thorns, and, and so does the Shroud of Turin. So it wouldn't have just been in contact around the perimeter, but around the whole top. Yeah, almost like a cap, the Correct. way you kind of have it pictured in here, right? Yes. Okay. Also, on the you talk about the way of the cross. You know, descriptions of crucifixion often suggest that there was one consistent way in which crucifixion was carried out, but the deeper I've studied, the more I have found variations. Correct. Well, uh, 70 AD, when Rome came and destroyed Jerusalem, uh, Flavius Josephus, who had been uh, a Jewish general, saw the way the winds was blowing, yes, yes. and uh, went over to Rome, that's why he got the Flavian dynasty name in his name, wrote the history, and he said, during some of the times, hundreds of Jews were crucified a day in a ways of jest. One crucified in one position, one in another position. So there were multiple ways they could be crucified. Mm -hmm. Now you also talk about in the way across that Jesus carried only the horizontal piece of the cross and that is consistent with the gospel. So we hear that more. But you also get into the size mm -hmm. of what that actually would be. Well, the reason I and do how is... how much it might weigh. Right, because, you know, Pierre Barbet, 1950, wrote a doctor at Calvary, you know, 75 to 125 pounds is what he says. And when I look to see what's his reference, mm -hmm. he doesn't have one. Mm -hmm. He does say he used to work with railroad ties, so that might have been okay. one of his images. Right. So I thought, how can we get at this? Nothing in history. The only thing I could think of was I had been in Rome, in the church of Santa Croce, in Jerusalem, in Rome, because it's built on soil from Jerusalem, right. placed in Rome. And in there, uh, St. Helena brought back what she believed to be the crossbar of the good thief. Mm -hmm. You know, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Right. And yeah, Dismas. That's right. So that cross measures roughly, that cross bar, about five by two and a half inches by six feet. Mm -hmm. And it's made of European black pine, which whenever they 
test, relics of the true cross are made of the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so if you know the volume and you know the density, the weight comes out to about 15 pounds. But remember, Jesus was scourged viciously. If you look in Luke's gospel, it suggests that Pilate wanted the scourging to be the entire punishment right. and then release him, which may account for why Jesus died more rapidly than Pilate expected. Right, you indicate that that might be part of it. Given Jesus' weakened state due to blood loss and pain, it would be surprising if he did not fall, because you talk about the, the idea, and the shroud supports showing abrasions on his knees. Oh, yes. I, I would be surprised if he didn't because he's already lost a lot of blood externally and internally. As long as it's not in your blood vessels, it's not doing you any good. And therefore, if you have something six feet long stretched out, it's easy to go off balance because mm -hmm. you're going to be very lightheaded in the heat. He hasn't eaten, hasn't drank, hasn't slept. Right. Easy to fall. And in fact, who tells us that Jesus carried his cross? Matthew doesn't, Mark doesn't, Luke doesn't. They all say, like Mark said on Palm Sunday, and they press Simon of Cyrene to carry the cross. Right. Only John tells us. Right. That's true. That's true. Uh, you talk about Calvary, Calvary and what it was. Mm -hmm. And they say it was a hill outside the western wall of Jerusalem where limestone was, was quarried from the 8th to the 1st century B.C., and so it was actually very close. Yes, right outside the wall, right, right next to the wall. So it wasn't a long distance from the place where mm -mm. he was scourged, condemned, uh, and brought there. In fact, within 10 years, where he was uh, killed was brought inside the new walls that were built outside of it. Do you have a sense of how long it would have taken for him, even in that state, to maybe traverse that So that even from the, the palace Paris. of Herod to their about 400 meters, about a quarter mile. But if you're just shuffling, I mean, that could be an easy half hour. And if you're falling and they need somebody else, so it could have been very slow if, if you're barely able to keep your eyes open and alert. Now, let's talk about, we, we, we also talk about many times we have people with stigmata. Yes. And, and the thing came up, well, it's the wrist or it's the middle of the hand, but the people who have stigmata, uh, I don't know if this destot space or... Uh, space of disto. Desto. Uh, and then uh, our old friend, uh, Dr. Frederick Zugaby, yes. you mentioned in here, who said he found a solution. The needle entered the palm and exited through the wrist uh, to, to kind of make it fit the Shroud of Turin, but you don't quite buy that. No, what, what he has is a case. He was a coroner. Mm -hmm. So there was somebody who had a, uh, a protection in his injury. In other words, somebody was being stabbed and they held up their hands and the stab went through the palm and came out the back of the wrist, which matches what's on the Shroud of Turin. Well, that is possible to put in something at that angle for a Roman soldier. That would be very challenging and not very easy at all. So I think that is quite unlikely. And that's where you kind of default to the He's going to take the easiest way he can get this right. job done. Stretch out the wrist, just put the nail anywhere near the middle of the wrist and pound. And what Pierre Barbet found with a series of 12 amputated arms is every time he did that, anywhere, it found its way like a funnel through the same four bones, didn't break them, and would hold the wrist firmly there. Now let's talk about, uh, you talk about the asphyxiation theory, because yes. that's one of the theories. I find the strongest evidence against the asphyxiation theory in Scripture itself. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said that, he breathed his last. So why does that prove it wasn't the asphyxiation because theory? Because people suffocating to death can't talk, let alone yell, let alone even be lucid. But uh, there's even better medical evidence. Uh, for instance, uh, all of the evidence shows that the arms on crucifixion victims were like this. They weren't like that. Uh, and when your arms are like this, there's no trouble breathing. Uh, secondly, Zugabi, and this was one of his beautiful studies using medical students, who else? Right. Straps him to a cross, their knees are bent. I remember yeah. the pictures, right? Yeah, the suffocation right. theory yeah. means that to exhale, you are supposed to straighten your legs. So he asks the victims on the cross, okay, straighten up your legs. None of them could do it even once. And yet, we know that crucifixion victims could live for days on the cross and would have to do that thousands of times. Mm -hmm. Now you talk about the four stages here on page 195 in the death, worse than degrees, and you talk about something called traumatic shock. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is traumatic shock and why do you see that as the main focus? Well, I've, I've read pathologists who know more than I do about that part of medicine, including my mentor, Dr. Bill Edwards at Mayo Clinic, where I got interested in this. 
And <clears throat> shock often refers to a low blood pressure, but it's the inability of the body to get enough blood and oxygen to the organs to keep them alive. So if you lose blood, and his shock was due to trauma. Other shock could be due to anaphylaxis, which we've, you know, heard in the news lately. It can be due to other things, but so trauma, blood loss, you lose fluid, not enough fluid to go around, blood pressure's too low, don't get enough oxygen to the brain, and eventually enough oxygen to the heart, and that's, that's where death will come in. And you think that's what was ultimately the cause? Yes, of I mean, the, the consistent thread reading everybody who's written on this, it, it shock was the major role. And then the final event would have been a heart rhythm problem. So if the heart muscle doesn't get enough oxygen, the, the, the lower part of the heart, the ventricle takes over, it beats really fast, and you can feel that something's different. So Jesus, in a natural way, could know his time was near mm -hmm. to say the last two things without having to posit anything supernatural about knowing, oh, I'm going to die in 30 seconds. And, and you believe also in the book that that would explain why he didn't last that long, right? Well, because he had lost so much blood with a, the brutal scourging, yes. And therefore, you know, the heart's beating harder and harder as, you know, he's got pain to contend with. He can't breathe as deep because he's got fluid where the lungs are. So eventually there's not enough blood to supply the heart. And once the heart can't beat, you die. So in, in going through and working through this, what would you say you walked away with that was different, the most different than what you thought going in? Oh, the suffocation theory mm -hmm. was something I'd been taught from, you know, you I just thought that you figured that's what you'd end up at. Uh, yes. Because and that's where you were coming from. That's, yes. Okay. So Bishop Connolly, why did Bishop Connolly write the intro well, I, to the I've book? I've been, I'm on the national board of the Catholic Medical Association. He's our Episcopal advisor. We often sit next to each other. I've mm -hmm. gotten to know him through the years. And then, not only because he's with us doctors, but because he did something quite courageous. He let everybody in the world know why he took a year off from being Bishop of Lincoln right. to go treat depression and anxiety. He was dealing with a great deal of suffering. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, what better person than this humble, holy shepherd who has a special ministry with physicians to write this? And I was so happy he did. Now you talk about in the book later on, our response to suffering, personal and relational. Why is that something that interests you? because I'm a doctor and I spent zero hours learning about suffering and how to deal with it in all of my medical training, yet every patient that comes in wants some aspect of their suffering addressed by us, and we are generally pretty poor at it, and I want it to get better. So who's Sally? Sally is my good, faithful wife of 30 years, better woman than I deserve. Right, and so when, when, you, when you write, when do you write? Oh, good question. I do my best writing uh, in the morning. Uh, and uh, I fully believe, you know, good hard exercise right beforehand releases good chemicals to help focus the mind. That's when I do my best writing. And how do you write? I'm usually standing up. I work at a standing desk. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. Uh, and yeah, have you always done that? How, how did you learn to or decide to work Because that for way? years I've tried to find a comfortable chair, and none of them were comfortable, so I finally started using a, a standing desk, and I wasn't in back pain anymore, mm -hmm. uh, and I was more alert. And as far as that, you're just using a laptop or whatever to write your, yes. or you? Yes. Although sometimes I'll, I'll write ideas just on paper. I'll just have a thinking session uh, with my eyes closed, and then I'll be sitting down like in a sofa, maybe with my legs crossed or legs out. And, and who's your editor? Uh, my editor, uh, Mary Beth Baker, now Mary Beth Giltner. She has been wonderful to work with at our Sunday Visitor. Did you, did you uh, pass this by uh, Sally? Oh, yes. Uh, she didn't read it. In fact, she's just finishing it right mm -hmm. now. But she's heard me talk about it for years, so. Right. Why do you think there's always been so much interest in, in, in this topic in a sense of, of how our Lord died physically? Or do you think that that's a new thing that we've, we've only now started to really look into? I think it's probably a new thing that came out with Secundo Pia's 1898 photographic negative of the Shroud of Turin. Okay, right. It got people really thinking because there's not much written about it before that time. Well, let me ask you, as, as, as a man of science, and you said you you believe obviously mm -hmm. in the shroud. What is the thing about the shroud's authenticity that rings the truest to you? No can ex nobody can explain how the image was created on the cloth. Um, that to me is the strongest. I mean, in all the other anatomical things mm -hmm. uh, along with it that fit with crucifixion, but particularly that. And if we, with all of our technology, can't figure it out, how did somebody you know seven eight hundred years ago figure it out?
Right, exactly. Well, let me ask you, uh, uh, have you written other books on, on these kind of topics? Or is this, this is my first? first book. I've written chapters for medical books. Mm -hmm. uh, I've written many medical articles. I've written many lay articles, but never a book before. And I never wanted to write a book. People have been telling me for years, write a book. I said, nope. And I said to God, if you want me to write right. a book, you have a publisher ask me. And finally, and someone did. So uh, has another publisher asked you about another book? They haven't. They haven't. So. But I've told God I would say yes if they asked me. You would. Yes. Okay. Well, very good. If you do, uh, stop by and see us again. <laughs> yes. A pleasure. Thank, Thank you so much, Dr. You, Dr. Thomas W. <laughs> McGovern. MD, the book, What Christ Suffered, A Doctor's Journey Through the Passion, published by OSV, available through the EW10 Religious Catalog, EW10RC.com. Check it out. A lot of interesting information in this book. And we shall see you next time right here on Bookmark. Thanks.